Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to ancient Greece to explore the life of Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae. We will watch him as a young boy, exploring the beauty of nature and the mystery of the world on the outskirts of the city. We will sail across the Mediterranean with him and his crew, feeling the sun on our faces and the salty ocean breeze brushing against our skin. Before we begin our journey with the great king, however, Let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the space that we are in, here and now. Gently close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no responsibilities. There are no obligations. With your eyes closed, turn your attention for a moment to where your body is in contact with the mattress. Feel it cushioning your legs, your arms, your torso, your stomach. Notice how the mattress and the pillow beneath your head embraces it, inviting it to rest after a long day. With your body sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress, and your eyes gently closed, you begin to notice something else, something rather remarkable. You are no longer in your bedroom, no longer inside your home, but you are safe and by yourself in a place of comfort and tranquility. Your eyes are still closed, so you can't see exactly where it is. But the smells, sounds, and feel of the air around you tells you everything you need to know. You feel the sun washing over your face. Your entire body is warmed by its gentle caress, beaming down on you. It feels like a bright summer day when there's nothing to do but lie around and enjoy the all-encompassing beauty of the world, where it's enough to simply be. Even in the warmth of that summer sun, you are not too warm. A gentle breeze laces its way through the countryside around you, whisking away the warm air, and bringing its unique aroma of citrusy freshness. And in that breeze, you get little hints to where you are. You smell a bouquet of beautiful wild plants, and their invigorating smell brings you comfort. It smells of sage, of juniper trees clinging to hillsides, of cypress and spicy pine trees that are further uphill from you. And in the distance, just barely tinging the breeze, you can smell that brilliant salty smell of the ocean coming through toward you from a distant, sparkling horizon. 
Your hand drapes just a bit to the ground below you. In the breeze, the tall cotton wool grass brushes against your hand. It brushes forward and back in the rhythm of endless fields of green. Forward and back in the comforting and enduring rhythm of nature, beckoning you to fall deeper and deeper into sleep. You listen to the sounds around you. There is no one else for miles, but there is plenty of enchanting countryside full of things that draw your attention. It is hard to ignore the hypnotic sound of the grass as it brushes against your hand, just barely kissing your skin and leaving that lingering touch. Beyond that, you can hear the swaying of the cypress and oak trees The cypress trees creak as their branches dance in the wind, filling the forest and the hillside with their soothing melody. And within those trees, birds sing their song into the universe. Each bird seems to have a call, a song even more beautiful than the last. You can almost see the notes of their song in your head, dancing and twirling as their pitch rises and falls. Tempo slows down and they cascade into a singular melody. This is truly peaceful. You breathe in that fresh air even deeper now, and the pleasurable feeling of the sun on your skin intensifies. You slowly become more aware of each and every part of your body that the sun is shining upon. You feel it shining down your head, and, as it does, any tension you've been carrying there begins to melt away, your jaw untenses, your tongue and your mouth relax, your shoulders fall away from your ears, giving you all the space that you need there to be comfortable. And any thoughts that may be spinning in your head, they slow and fade away until they are absolutely no concern of yours. The rest of your body relaxes along with it. You feel any tension, pressure, or pain disappear from your limbs, allowing you to truly embrace the comfort that your bed provides. You breathe a little deeper, feeling the nourishing fresh air fill your lungs. And, as you do, you feel your heartbeat slow to a steady, healthy pace. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find comfort in the space that we are in here and now, let's explore this ancient world in which you have been resting. You find yourself in the countryside of Greece, outside the city of Mycenae. 
It's a beautiful part of the country, with rolling hills coated in swaying golden and green grasses and shrubs. Olive trees dot the hillsides, bringing with them a fresh, invigorating scent, and lining the horizon with their breathtaking shape. Mycenae exists now only as an archaeological site, but where you are, it is a thriving city. You look down on it from the outskirts in the hills, watching as cheerful people make their way through the stone streets. The city looks far more advanced than many people would assume it was. Booths selling food and wares pepper the edges of the streets, and the entire city is alive with the smell of roasted lamb, lentil soup, cheese pies, and honey sweets. Everyone smiles as they go about their business cloaked in simple, yet beautiful clothing. As you're standing and admiring the view, a child darts by you. He is clutching some scrolls in his hand. As his dark hair shimmers against the golden light of the sun. This little raven-haired boy is Agamemnon. Sources vary on who exactly his parents originally were, but many people believe that he and his brother Menelaus were the sons of Atreus, the king of Mycenae. His mother is believed to be Aerope, the daughter of the king of Crete. Agamemnon and Menelaus were raised here in Mycenae by their father and mother. But being a ruler in ancient Greece was no easy task. And, being a king's child, did not, unfortunately, shield you from affairs of the state. Agamemnon and his brother were great-grandchildren of the famous Tantalus, and their whole family suffered from a curse of gods brought on by Tantalus's transgressions. In the midst of constant power struggles between Agamemnon's father and his twin brother, growing up in Mycenae was not particularly peaceful. Agamemnon frequently heard unsettling whispers and could see the concern on the faces of his parents, even when he was just a young child. However, Agamemnon was a strong child, a child seemingly able to withstand whatever the universe sent sailing his way. He could take these struggles with a childlike smile, and a hope unlike any other, and try to forge on ahead. His brother, however, was a bit more tender-hearted than Agamemnon was. Many nights, as Agamemnon curled up in bed, he could hear the gentle sobs of his brother 
in the next room. He knew that his brother was not good at enduring the stress that their parents were under, and that he often worried, lying awake at night, hoping that he would be less afraid. So, instead of letting his brother cry, Agamemnon would rise to his feet in the moonlight. As soon as his tiny feet would hit the cool stone ground, Agamemnon felt a wave of confidence wash over him encouraging him and telling him he was doing the right thing. As quietly as he could, Agamemnon would tiptoe down the hallway, careful to be especially light-footed as he passed by his parents' quarters. Some nights, flickering candles illuminated the edges of his parents' door. He could occasionally hear their muffled whispers, arguing about what to do with the kingdom and their family on the nights where there were no candles flickering. Agamemnon felt a wave of relief. It told him that things were all right, that tomorrow morning his parents would have smiles on their faces, and they'd partake in cheerful conversations over breakfast. Either way, he would continue on down the hallway, tiptoeing the whole way, and feeling a sense of pride as he did so. When he had finally entered his brother's room at the end of the hall, he would often find his brother kneeling in front of the window. Agamemnon was a strong boy, but he also had a gentle spirit about him. When he saw his beloved brother looking out the window with tears in his eyes, he felt an ache deep inside him, a need to comfort Menelaus, who was the youngest. On nights like these, Agamemnon would walk over and sit beside his brother, illuminated By the silver light of the moon, he would wipe his brother's tears and tell him stories. His stories were not about their parents or about the life they were living at the time or about the world they knew, but stories about mythical heroes, the greatest heroes who ever lived. Agamemnon passed these stories on to his brother, as if he was performing in front of an audience of thousands. He acted them out, swaying and dancing and staggering across the room, enacting some hero at war or the hero vanquishing a monster, or the hero about to win the battle, deservedly so. The longer Agamemnon told these stories, the more the sadness would drain from his brother's expression. Once again, Menelaus would go back to being a child full of hope and joy and enthusiasm for the heroes of the world. Agamemnon loved seeing this transition within Menelaus. Every single time 
he saw the sparkle return to his brother's eyes. He felt as if their bond was strengthened, as if he had done what he came to this earth to do. Then, soon after, Menelaus would undoubtedly yawn. Agamemnon would help his brother into bed, tucking the soft, fluffy blankets up around his chin. And as Menelaus drifted off to sleep, Agamemnon would smile down at him and promise that soon things would be different. Soon, the power struggle between his parents and their other relatives would end. Agamemnon wasn't sure if he believed it himself or not. But he knew his brother deserved to feel comforted by that prospect. If only one of them could feel the pleasure and relief from believing it, he was happy it was his little brother. Over time, as the boys grew, those nights began happening more and more frequently. The drama between their parents and their relatives seemed to be reaching a crescendo, and as it did, it became clear that Agamemnon and Menelaus were no longer safe living in the home they had grown up in with their parents. When they were not even ten years old, they were sent away from home. It was the middle of the night when they were ushered out of beds down to the waterfront. Their parents had a concerned, heavy look deep within their eyes, and though they tried to cover it, Agamemnon could see it for what it was. Their parents hugged each of them, making them promise that they would be good, though he was not even prompted to. Agamemnon looked at his parents and promised them that he would take care of his little brother. His mother kissed him upon the forehead, allowing her lips to linger for a moment. She told her darling boy that she knew he would take care of his younger brother. The boys waved goodbye as they boarded a small boat on the river, helmed by a few trusted members from their parents' circle, and as they glided down the river with stars sparkling above them and the universe reflected in the calm water below, they were eternally thankful that they had each other. Their parents told them that they were going to stay with Tyndareus, the king of Sparta. Though they were from Mycenae, the two brothers were received by Tyndareus and his court with kindness and respect. They were given a safe place to live, and for the first time in their lives, they lived relatively stress-free. The kingdom of Sparta was located in southeastern Peloponnese, on the banks of the Eurotas River, and the two boys spent most of their adolescence either splashing in the water along the banks or playing in the hills and forests surrounding the kingdom. Every day, they were surrounded by the brilliant, invigorating smell of the sea, 
coming through from a nearby coast, and every day, they embraced the feeling of the sun against their skin. And they weren't alone. Tyndarius had several children and stepchildren of his own through his wife, Leda. Though Tyndarius and Leda were married, Leda also had a daughter with the Greek god Zeus. And she was, perhaps, the most remarkable child the kingdom had ever seen. The moment Leda and Tyndarius looked upon their daughter, they were breathless. She looked as though she was a goddess herself. She was a perfect child with a glow about her. A golden glow that seemed to radiate from her very soul. And as she grew into adolescence, it was undeniable that she was beautiful. Some argued that she was the most beautiful woman in the entire world. And it was hard to disagree. When she walked along the streets, people would turn to gaze upon her, taken by the extravagance of her beauty. Her name was Helen. In childhood, Menelaus was smitten by her almost immediately. She was a year or so younger than him, and every time she came to play or her eyes fell upon him, he felt his heart swell within his chest. He wasn't really sure why that would happen and what it meant. But, wanting to keep peace and be a respectful boy, he hardly ever spoke to her unless he was spoken to. Coming to the kingdom of Sparta was a blessing he dared not ruin. Agamemnon, on the other hand, often encouraged his brother to pursue Helen Seeing how taken Menelaus was with her from a young age. And, truthfully, it wasn't just her beauty that Menelaus was taken by. She was a gentle soul, an intelligent girl. She spent much of her time reading, a habit she adopted from a young age. And, though she was breathtakingly beautiful, she wasn't the one who tried to get attention, nor ached for it in any way. Regardless, as time passed, the children all went about their business and grew into young adulthood. Menelaus and Agamemnon spent much of their time studying and training for battle, as peace was fragile and often short-lived in the kingdom. And then, one day, everything changed unexpectedly. Helen was of marrying age, and it was time for her to have suitors. Soon, the kingdom of Sparta was flooded by men from all over, desperate to have Helen's hand in marriage. Rumors had spread throughout the land and across the seas that Helen was the most beautiful woman in the world, and the men who arrived could see rather clearly that that was not a rumor at all. 
it was true. The men would gather before Helen, Tyndarius, and Helen's brothers, Castor and Pollux. They would come bearing gifts, hoping that those gifts would convince Castor, Pollux, and finally Tyndarius that they were worthy of Helen's hand. Helen would sit upon a throne and watch as man after man approached her family, asking for her hand. She wasn't particularly drawn to any of the men, which was rather peculiar. There were proven warriors and heroes asking for her hand, but she craved something more than a strong man or a man who had proven himself. She craved someone who had depth, who was capable of love on a large scale. And so she sat on her throne, twirling the long, tight black curls that cascaded down over her shoulders like a waterfall. Every man who looked upon her was practically stupefied, which only made her like them less. But then, someone approaching her father and brothers made her perk up. It was a familiar face. It was Agamemnon. Helen leaned in, desperate to hear the conversation between Agamemnon and her family. Agamemnon revealed that he was not there for himself. Rather, he was there for his brother. He was there for Menelaus. Helen felt a warmth radiate through her body at the mere mention of his name. She had admired Menelaus greatly growing up, and had always been eager to get closer to him. Knowing that he wanted her hand in marriage was something that made her feel as though everything was right in the world. Eventually, it came time for her and her family to pick the best suitor for her. It was a tough task, and Tyndarius was wary that those who would be rejected may become angry and try to wage war upon the kingdom. So, he made all the suitors swear a solemn oath to defend the chosen husband against whoever should quarrel with him. The suitors all agreed, and eventually, after much consideration, Tyndarius came to his decision. He decided that the husband of Helen would be none other than Menelaus. When Menelaus heard the news, he was overjoyed, for so long had he admired Helen, had respected her so deeply, and now she was to be his bride, and he was to be the heir to the throne of Sparta. Agamemnon, too, was thrilled about this decision. He became a close advisor of his brother, and as Menelaus took the throne, becoming the true king of Sparta, Agamemnon stood by his side with pride. For ten years, they lived rather blissfully. The kingdom was at peace, as much peace as there could be during that time period. And Helen, Agamemnon, and Menelaus 
were incredibly close. They spent many days together, wandering the gardens, talking about policy and the future of the kingdom. At night, they often dined on extravagant dishes together, laughing and enjoying one another's company, just as they had when they were all kids. It was a blessing that they were together, one that they were fully appreciative of and thankful for. Every day together seemed like the best day. But, being in ancient Greece at the time, even if you were fortunate enough to live in peacetime, meant that trouble was probably stirring from Mount Olympus and its capricious gods. And that is precisely what happened to the three of them, as well as the entire kingdom of Sparta. On Olympus, an argument was sparked between three mighty goddesses, Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. They could not agree on who was the most beautiful of the three, and none of the other gods dared to judge, terrified of the wrath of the other goddesses. Knowing that there was only one way to solve this, Zeus called upon Prince Paris of Troy, who lived as a simple shepherd and was known by many to be the most honest, truthful man in all the land. Zeus asked Paris to decide and pick which of the three goddesses was the most beautiful of all. Desperate to be crowned the most beautiful, Aphrodite approached Paris with an offer. If he declared her the most beautiful goddess of all, then she would help Paris win over the most beautiful woman in the world as his bride. Seduced by the idea of companionship with the most beautiful bride, Paris agreed and declared Aphrodite the most beautiful of the three goddesses. However, Aphrodite wasn't going to make her end of the deal easy for Paris. She told Paris that he could have the most beautiful woman as his bride, but that he would first have to go collect her. Snapping her fingers, she transported Paris to Sparta where he stood outside the castle, itching to finally have his bride in his arms. High above him, he could see a silhouette of a woman sitting by a window, draped in sparkling moonlight. Paris climbed the castle walls, carefully making his way up to the balcony where Helen resided. With Aphrodite's help, he was able to seduce Helen and carry her to a boat that Aphrodite had waiting for him, a boat that would whisk them away to safety. Menelaus saw the whole thing, but he was much too late to interfere. Tears sprung from his eyes at the loss of his beloved wife, and, just like when they were children, Agamemnon was the first to answer the cries of his brother. He rushed to his brother's side, and when he heard what had happened, he told Menelaus they would do absolutely whatever it took to ensure that Helen 
returned home safely. And sadly, thus began the Trojan War. Menelaus called upon all the men who had been Helen's suitors all those years ago, urging them to fulfill their oath of defending whoever Helen's chosen husband was. The men were reluctant, but they knew it was their sworn duty to uphold the oath they had taken. And so, they all gathered on boats and sailed for Troy to bring Helen back home where she belonged. Agamemnon led this group of people. As always, he wanted nothing more than to see his brother smile, to see his sadness disappear. Agamemnon boarded the boat and sailed for Troy. The sparkling Mediterranean waters put him at ease, though he knew the battle before them would not be an easy one. He stood upon the bow of the ship for quite some time, breathing in the invigorating smell of the salty air and letting it wash all of his troubles away. He managed to find peace in the chaos that was looming on the horizon. And before they even arrived in Troy, the battle proved to be challenging. The Greek gods took sides in the conflict, and Artemis, siding with the Trojans, made it so the wind would not blow for their ships sailing toward Troy. Eventually, the Greeks led by Agamemnon made it to the city, but what waited for them there was no easier. The battle for Troy lasted for ten long years. Every step of the way, Agamemnon was a calm, responsible leader, supportive of the people fighting under him, and incredibly desperate to bring Helen back to his brother. Eventually, their way of battle proved to not be effective. Searching for a solution, Odysseus devised a new ruse. A giant, hollow, wooden horse was made, an animal that was sacred to the Trojans. The soldiers led by Odysseus hid inside the giant, hollow, wooden horse, while the rest of the Greek army burned their camp and pretended to sail away from Troy. Thinking that the Greeks were gone and the war was over, the Trojans dragged the horse inside the city. But once the horse was wheeled inside, the soldiers jumped out, killed the guards, and with the help of the remaining army hidden around the city, they finally conquered it. Agamemnon ran through the city with Menelaus by his side, desperate to find Helen. Menelaus carried his sword, fearing that his beloved wife had betrayed him. But when he laid eyes upon Helen, he dropped the sword the ground. She was the most beautiful woman on earth, and all that time without her had made it feel like a piece of him was missing. He gathered his beautiful wife in his arms and hugged her. Just like that, the war was over, and all was right in the world. As they sailed home, watching the sun set over the distant horizon, 
Agamemnon couldn't help but smile. He and his brother had been through so much together, and now, now they have proven that together they could handle anything. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story about mischievous gods and unwavering humans, and that it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>